Nothing's going to stop the praise. <laughs> Woohoo! Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we love you because you first loved us. Lord Jesus, we love Fill the earth with your praise. Lord Jesus, we love Let all men see. Let all men see your grace. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we love. You have all my affections. You have all my affections, Lord. Give him two. Give him all your affections. Lord Jesus, we love. You're everything to me. You're everything to me. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Every single human being, every angel, every part of God's creation that was created to worship Him and give Him praise, which simply means created to walk with Him, created to know Him. No matter whether they in heaven or hell, in the earth or under the earth, every single living being will be raised up and will stand before the living God one day and everyone, the hardest atheist, the most ruthless unbeliever, the most defiant being that's ever lived, their knee will bow before Christ Jesus. And they won't bow because there comes some soldier and kicks their legs out from underneath them. They'll bow because His glory and His majesty and His love and even in the hatefulness of their sin and disobedience, even though that one day they call out and cry, let the rocks fall upon us and hide us from the face of Him that sits upon the throne, yet they'll be overwhelmed with that love and that grace and that goodness of God. They'll say, you are the living God. You are the Lord. They'll bow before Him, but it'll be too late for many. It'll be forever and eternally too late for many. Somebody wants to talk about how black dark hell is and how fiery it is. I tell you, hell could not be any worse than just to be absent of God's glory and presence. Hell could not be any worse than to be absent of His love and His grace and His majesty. To not be able to turn to Him and immediately feel His presence should you Veer off the path of that manifest glory. If there's anything that has to take place in the midst of the church, there must be a revival in the people of God's life of His manifest glory. For many people have an intellectual knowledge, but you can't take that which you know in your mind and transfer it to your heart. You cannot. You can know all the good things and all the right things. You can know all the revelation and majesty, but it cannot be transferred to your heart. Only God can do that, and when it happens... Suddenly a manifest presence of God comes because it's an irresistible pull upon His anointing and glory and grace. It's truth in the inward parts and the hidden parts. There He makes us to know wisdom. It's a pull. It's an irresistible pull upon the presence of God. Too many people try a mental affirmation. They think that it's okay. I know God because I know about Him. I love asking people, do you know who Christ Jesus is? Because I've watched, even in foreign countries, they'll say, yeah, I know who Jesus Christ is. But when I get finished defining who he is and declaring who he is, they have to admit, no, I did not know that he did that. No, I did not know that he was like that. No, I did not know that he had that power. No, I did not know he was at work in that way. 
When I talk about Jesus who has all authority in heaven and earth and that he has sovereign power and rules and reigns in a kingdom right now called heaven. That you have the privilege of stepping into simply by making a feeb the feeblest request. Simply by crying out with your heart, Oh Lord Jesus, come and help me. With any kind of sincerity and truth. He is so, he made it so simple. To step over into that realm to leave the realms of darkness and blindness of heart and mind and soul behind. To live in the light as he is in the light. To walk around in the realms of heaven and be as it were seated with him as it is in truth. There you begin to live out your life for him. You become so filled with his compassion you feel the same way the father feels about a lost and dying world. You'll give all that you have to see them reached. Not just to hear, but to go and compel them to come in. That his house may be full. Go and compel them. There is a lot of activity. There is a lot of expenditure of energy and finances in, in, in the midst of the church. But what happens when God's people have been given the ability with the anointing of the Holy Spirit to go and compel like God the Holy Ghost compels men to come? Into the house so they can be taught of God, trained up. Hallelujah. I tell you, your life would not be wasted if you spent a month getting one soul. Your life would not be wasted if you just did nothing but track down one soul. Hallelujah. And stay at that one soul, that one soul, that one person. You went to, you went to bed at night praying for him. You woke up in the morning praying for him. You are continually calling him and saying, come now, go to meeting with me. And then you recognize, okay, Father, I know that if there was a greater increase in my life and the anointing, I would be able to compel in a more powerful and undeniable way. And then there, there's where our fellowship with Him goes to another level as we begin to stand in that place where we ask according to His will. Whatever we ask of He does it. Tonight, we're going to have a great Holy Ghost meeting and talk to you about things that I've heard many people say but I, wanna, I want you to receive the grace of God to live it. I want you to receive the grace of God to live it. My goodness, when you begin to understand that without him you can do nothing, and you begin to live that way, oh my goodness. When all of a sudden you say, Lord, I don't know to turn to the right or to the left, show me. And it's about every detail of your life. And you're asking him to give you wisdom, to give you knowledge, to give you insight. I'm telling you right now, that is a relationship that will not be denied. That is a relationship that God personally has authorized and designed. And when you begin to become steadfast in those things, they become a reality in your life. Thirteen years ago, we laid hold on this property. Thirteen years ago, Pastor Geneva and uh, Amy Scott broke into the place, committed breaking an entry because there was nobody around. It was so, hard, so strong in our hearts. Thirteen years. It is a proof that if you write the vision, if you, it, though the vision, Terry, it should surely come to pass. I mean, I didn't write it. Though the vision, Terry, it should surely come to pass. Great champion of the faith, one of my dear friends, Rodney, said to me, prophesied to me that this property would be ours. He said it 12 years ago. <laughs> and we did everything we could do to get in and take a hold of it. But we understand, we've come to a place in God that if you don't weary in well-doing, if you stay at it, you stay at it, you stay at it. We're probably called once a year on this place at least. Sometimes more. And then in 2008, God made me to know that he was about to do a great thing in the earth. He was about to do some amazing things in 2009. I looked at the place and said, it's too small. Somebody said, what are you talking about? You don't even fill it with the people that you have. What are you talking about? I'm not looking at the people that I have. I'm looking at a faith realm. I'm looking into a realm of things that God has designed and decided to do. That he must pour, he must pour out his fire upon before he can do it. The wind of God must blow upon it before it can be just like it is in, in, in Father's heart. So it can operate like He has designed it to operate so it can have the results that only He can produce. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah. Listen, if you don't weary in well-doing, you shall reap. Many people weary. They don't understand Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. You don't weary, you reap. This is why men ought to always pray, Luke chapter 18, not faint. Look at the widow. She continually came and wearied the judge. I don't weary my father. I just continually keep my petition up there. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this great outpouring of your Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father, for raising up a people in the earth to know how to worship you, to know how to praise you, who know how to flow in your anointing, who know how to be those manifested sons, those sons and daughters of, uh, that you created when you purchased us with the blood of Jesus and poured out your spirit, poured out your fire. <laughs> <laughs> See, I took a whole long time ago that everything I asked the Father in Jesus' name, He would do it. God's not raising any brats. People think just because they want to have instant this, instant that. Inst you can have your instant cocoa, your instant coffee. You can have your instant whatever else, your ready-made meals with all of its contaminants in it. Huh? You can have whatever you want on an instant basis, but in God, you're going to be prepared unto every good work. You're going to learn how to walk in divine order. And if you don't like divine order, if you don't want to shine up for the military in God, my goodness gracious, you're never going to go anywhere. Ha! Huh. You won't go anywhere. But if you're willing to be a good soldier, hallelujah, that learns everything there is to know about soldiering through love. Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, there's so many people, they want to do things their way. And then they, all the time they're saying, well, I'm doing it God's way. And I, I hear it from the Jehovah's Witness to the Mormons to the Orthodox Jews to the Muslims to the Hindus to the Christians of every form and fashion and denomination. But you know, there's only one word of God that stands forever. There's only one word of God, spirit and life. There's only one word of God by which men will be judged. There's only one word of God by which men can be saved. Hallelujah. And it tells every one of us what we're supposed to do in the most simplest terms possible. And then Christ Jesus came and showed us how to do it so that no man is without excuse. No man has an excuse. God said, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And he didn't make any escape for anybody. That's how we're supposed to deal with the world. He said, I want you to love your enemies. And that's how we're supposed to deal with those who are hostile against us, who persecute us and hate us and would try to take up uh, some kind of a means to destroy us and try to, to stop us. Lots of people just try to stop me. I look at men trying to stop me and I just roll my eyes. Hey, look, angels try to stop me. Angels of darkness try to stop me. Some men try to stop me. Forget about it. They didn't have a chance. And it doesn't even faze me. It doesn't even bother me. Somebody, oh, you know, you need to stop that because they'll be talking bad about you and you know what's going to happen is going to hurt your career development. No, they can't hurt your career development talking bad about you. Huh? If an angel can't stop, if angels of darkness can't stop you, what can a little old man do? <laughs> Hallelujah. God said no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Amen. You'll rise in judgment and condemn all those who test, try to bring forth a testimony against you. That's what God says. I don't worry about none of that stuff. God wants you to have a bigger, God wants you to have a bigger view of things. And when you're captivated with this love relationship with him, your enemies, you just got more compassion for their soul than interest in what they're saying about you. Selfish interest doesn't dominate your mind so you don't retaliate out of that. What happens is God's love dominates your heart and your mind and it keeps you there in a place of feeling the same way you felt about it before they became cantankerous or argumentative or hateful or whatever. And then, and then, and then, and then God tells us how we're supposed to love one another in the household of faith. And he takes it to another level. And I'm telling you, God's people are going to have to understand, you're not going to get those things that Father has purposed for you to have until you obey the foundational and fundamental properties of his spirit. Listen, people want to have a house before they have the foundation. The foundation's got to be laid forth, 
laid first. People want to start exploring the details before the foundation and the plan is consented to. Are you listening to me? He says, concerning the household of faith, I want you to love one another is just like, just, like I love you, just like I love you. Then you have to ask yourself, how is it that Jesus loves me right now? You have to begin to explore your definition of grace. You have to begin to explore your definition of mercy. You've got to begin to explore your definition of loving kindness. You've got to exp- explore your definition of God's divine empowerment for your life. Huh? You've got to explore just how close he is to you. Because then you begin to reckon with how much he loves you. And you begin to behold it in the cross. I love what Paul said in Galatians chapter 6. He said, all these people got all these ideas. They talk about circumcision, uncircumcision. They're going to boast in their flesh. or They're going to boast in this thing or that thing. He said, listen, I don't boast in circumcision or uncircumcision. It doesn't matter to me. All I boast in is the cross of Christ. That's where the new creature came. That's where we've been purchased by the power of the living God. And, 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 and he said, that's all that matters. Circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision doesn't matter. But a new creature. What is fundamental about the new creature? It has the capacity to love. He that dwells in love dwells in God. Has the capacity then to begin to understand and relate on the very principle by which we've come to God how to relate to one another. That principle is Jesus died for us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. He laid down his life for us. So... John said, you ought to also lay down your life for the brethren. Amen. Amen. And people think that they can escape that. They think they can go do this and that thing, the other thing. And somehow they're not going to be held accountable for it on that day. False. False. You will be held accountable. It'll It'll bring to light every hidden thing. If you and I would just simply live our lives as God has purposed, that we see him before us and on our right hand, that we should not be moved, we would always live in the consciousness of his presence. Being ready to give an account. Come here, baby. Come stand up here with me. There's not much light up here, but stand down there and stand up here. Which one do you like better? You show the way. (laughs) Good morning. Number our days. Come up here. Then we may apply our heart unto these things. Our heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The heart. One of the greatest wisdoms you will find. Well, before I say that, let me tell you this. The only wise God authored this book. This is the only wisdom you need. That's it. The only wise God knew every single need you would have. Every need he showed us forth in his word from the time you were born till the time you will exhale your last breath. The greatest wisdom is found in Amos 4.12. Prepare to to meet meet your God. God. Prepare. Yes, that's what I'm doing. You college students, you prepare for those finals. If you're going to go to a job interview, you prepare for it. That's nothing. Preparing to meet your God. That's everything. Because there... (laughs) <laughs> there will be your eternal placement in glory. So in True. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, yeah. that we may receive those things done in the body, mm-hmm. according that he hath done, whether mm. good or bad. Mm. You can cancel earthly appointments, but you will not be able to cancel that great day. And in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 and 12, it says, So we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus. Oh, God. So that every one of us will give an account of himself unto God. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, To study to show yourself approved 
icon unto man, unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, to rightly divide the word of truth. And then in Hebrews 9.27, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after that the judgment. Once to die, even Enoch and Elijah will come back to earth and die that physical death. But I'm excited about the judgment seat of Christ. I am motivated by one thing in this earth. I live for one thing. Me too. Heaven. Me too, baby. Heaven. I know heaven is Jesus and Jesus is mine, so I'm living in heaven today. The Lord told me how to have days of heaven upon the earth. Lay up his word in my heart and in my soul. That's right. Do all that he has spoken. But I pray thy kingdom come. Even though Luke says the kingdom of God is within me, there's a kingdom that's coming. There's a new heavens and a new earth that's coming. <laughs> My motivation is heaven, and there's probably one number one reason. So that I can look upon the face of my heavenly Father and of my Savior, Jesus Christ, and I can look upon the face of the precious Holy Spirit. Baby, I'm with you. Oh, I get to look upon their face. I tell the Lord, it's just not the same being here now. I mean, I started crying one night in meditation of Psalm 37 when it says, rest patiently and wait for the Lord. I'm like, I don't want to wait. It's just not the same having you here bodily so I can see your face. <laughs> But he says what's going to well up within us is joy unspeakable and full of glory for those who believe, even though, even though they've not seen his face yet. <laughs> no, we've not seen. We rejoice with joy unspeakable. So okay. what else am I motivated about living for heaven? I am motivated, mm. as Revelation mm. talks about, mm. that there's not going to be any more crying or sorrow or pain or death. I think those are pretty good motivators. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like be pain. honest. Don't, don't like be it. so spiritual. I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah. We Ooh. hate pain. We hate sorrow. Go read Revelation 2 and 3. He that overcomes those rewards are unbelievable. Yes. And one of the greatest. Jesus said, you will walk with me. Mm. And you'll be clothed in white mm. raiment. <laughs> I want to eat of the tree of life. I don't want my name blotted out of the book of life. And it won't be if I overcome. <laughs> so, we possess something so powerful on the one hand, yet so dangerous on the other hand. Mm. Our will. Mm -hmm. Our will. Our will. <laughs> the prayer is, thy will be done. Thy will, Father. So what I do, because I'm applying my heart unto wisdom, is I live the life of John 15, 5, yes. and I recognize, I can of mine own self do nothing. Without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. So that's how I'm going to live. I'm going to live saying, without you, Jesus, I choose to not have my will do anything in and of itself. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to thee. That's how this walk began, and that's how it is all the way through till the end. Till the end. So Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, I look at my model, Jesus Christ, and what did he do? He tells me in John 8, 20 and 29, he so submitted his will to the Father, he did nothing of himself. I know from 1 John 2, 17, it says, but he that does the will of God shall abide forever, shall live forever in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. God has laws. One of the greatest wisdoms you will find is knowing and understanding because 
sight, our natural sight is good, but insight is far superior. Be not deceived, he opens up with. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. I don't even like that word, corruption. It goes hand in hand with destruction. But he that sows to the Spirit mm. shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life, and that's what I live for. That's it. I live for <laughs> everlasting life. <laughs> but Paul is speaking to the Galatians. He's speaking to the church. And he's telling the church, be not deceived. God is not mine. So that's got my attention. True. Be not deceived. Bold Paul had a fear. He declares it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Yes. But I fear, lest by any means is the serpent beguiled Eve. That's right. Through subtility. That your minds would be corrupted from, from the, the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity of our need to sow to the Spirit. The simplicity of not leaning to our own will. Correct. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. That's the most dangerous thing you can do. But the greatest thing you can do is acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your paths. That path that leads right into heaven. Beautiful. Look at this simplicity in Genesis chapter 2 where God said, Of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but of the one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat of it, four words, thou shalt surely die. Now look at one more chapter over, chapter 3. Yeah. The serpent, the most subtle of all the beasts of the field, Beguiled. directly contradicts the word of God because Eve leaned to her own understanding. She opened herself up. The serpent said, ye shall not. Adds one word that changed the course of history. You shall not surely die. And it planted a seed in her. We look at Romans 6.23 and it says, The wages of sin is death. <laughs> but that same voice oh, is still God. going throughout the earth today the and saying, You shall not surely die. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Let me say this. You know, I've watched as so many people, they want the things of God, they read about the things of God, and sure, they should want them. But they won't come into divine order. They'll talk about the details and the peripheral things that they, their perception can see and understand, the things that their own interest demands. But they will not come into the order that God commands. Look at this. The church needs revival. The church needs to be the very expression of Jesus Christ. But for the church to be the expression of Jesus Christ, the church has to come under the authority. The church, does the church have to be under the authority of Jesus? Does the church have to be under? It's not a trick question. Does the church need to be under the authority of Christ Jesus? Does the church need to be under the rulership of Christ Jesus? Yes. Does, the, does the church need to first fully and 100% lose its own identity and accept only the identity of Christ Jesus? Yes. So it is with a woman and her husband. My wife and I have a wonderful relationship that most people can't have. Because today in a modern age, most people will not submit to the divine order that God designed. They won't have it. They can't have it. 
because she's fully submitted to my authority. Her whole identity is Miss Mark Spitzbergen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The church has to have their whole authority as Christ Jesus. And when we do, then all of a sudden, all of the details, all the blessings, all the favor, all the provision then is supplied. People want to talk about the details, about whether or not they're getting whatever they're supposed to be getting out of the relationship, out of the deal, before the foundation is laid and the consecration is made. And when we signed up, we vowed to live a different life, to receive a new name. A new name, the Lord said. I give you a new name. I'm giving you my name. The authority of it, the glory of it. But we want to live our own life. And we want, we want to say that we're doing the will of our Father in heaven, but we won't listen to his word. We won't be willing to first and foremost consecrate to the contract. We no longer live. Husbands and wives, you listen to me. If you don't have the divine order in your house, as God described it, as Paul described it and said, God is the head of Jesus. Jesus is the head of man. And man is the head of woman. Your house is going to be a mess and you'll never have the blessings of days of heaven upon earth. You'll never have the blessings that God has commanded for your life. The church the same way. Just as... The woman must take on the identity of men. I did not, my wife's maiden name is Harding. I did not become Mark Harding. No, thank the Lord. In fact, I did not come, become Mr. Ann Harding. <laughs> Satan would like to do that. That would be his ultimate goal in a ceremony, a wedding ceremony. To try to make, to try, it would be the same as trying to make Jesus fit into man, saying, Jesus, you got to be just like us if you want to hang out with us. You want to hang out with us? you got to be like us. you got to do what we want you to do. Too much of that goes on. We won't, say it that, we won't say it that radically, but too much of that goes on in the realms of self-interest. See, it's got to be, we got to understand, we all are nothing people. We really are. You really are. You really are an all or nothing person. Yeah, all humanity is all or nothing. And God is all or nothing. We used to sing a song, he must be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Because it truly is all or nothing. A consecration to say, I'm going to get this thing right. And the grace of God is there to help us get it right unless we leave. I watch people leave the kingdom of God all the time. They, want, they leave because they say this didn't happen for them, that didn't happen, this expectation wasn't realized, they didn't get this thing and that thing. There's nothing about to do, there's nothing to do with that. It has to do with reality of the foundation. Did you lose your life? Did you turn your life completely over to the will of the Father, not to do your own will anymore, not to live your own life anymore, not to have your own identity anymore? Huh? My wife and I have had a blessed life, and it continues to be blessed. And now, because she's willing to come into that place of relationship with me, like I've come into that place of relationship with Jesus, she say, well, exactly what is she supposed to do? She's supposed to do for me and to me exactly what I'm supposed to do for Jesus and to Jesus. So just figure it out there. You know what I'm saying? She, I'm supposed to do to Jesus exactly what Jesus did to the Father to God. So there's no, there's no abstract, it's your interpretation, it's your ideology, that's nonsense. Huh? That's like telling the teacher in math class that it was his interpretation or her interpretation, that answer that, she, that they derived from the formula. Nonsense. Nonsense. It is what it is. Period. Oh, God, I pray in Jesus' name that the ears of God's people will be open to hear. Because when we do, when I come into to that place of, of relationship with Jesus that he's called me to come into, I then get blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. He takes care of all of my needs. I get all the provision. I get more than I could have ever, I could have ever asked or wanted or demanded or desired out of my own human pre preference. He protects me. He keeps me. He, he, he serves me. 
Many people want to be served by the Spirit, the things that God has promised to serve. Many people want to be served the things that Jesus has promised to be served, but they've never come in to a place of the relationship that God demands. Because my wife is what she is to me in divine order. I want nothing but divine order. I'm, people say, you got it. People say this thing and that thing about covenant. Covenant is divine order. Covenant is divine order. I don't believe personally that any person even on the face of the earth has the authority to pronounce a, a husband, a man and a woman, husband and wife, except for someone who has the authority of heaven. Doesn't even belong outside the church. Captain can't do it, Justin of Peace can't do it, no, only God's man can do it. God has announced you and me of entrance into the realms of heaven. But it's laying our own, leaving our own identity behind. It's being willing to do whatever he says all the time. Well, I don't want to do whatever he says all the time. Don't I have my own life to live? No. No. How does that smack up against side? How does that, how does that overlap humanism? How does that overlap all the stuff they've been telling you at school about, you know, he man, woman lives? Huh? How, how does that overlap with all the stuff you've been hearing in school about, look, you have the right to pursue your own life? I mean, the teachers used to tell my kids, they say, you, you don't have to listen to your parents. You're 16 now. You've got to find your own life. My, my kids are like, they could identify it. That is the demonic realm. They could identify it. So many people sit in church and those same kinds of influences are happening to them in their relationship with Christ Jesus and they're completely void of understanding. They've never made the connection. Why? Because when you're out of divine order in one area, you're going to be out of it in every area. And I'm telling you the truth. You are not preparing to meet thy God when you can walk in such unholy boastfulness instead of holy fear. Hey, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to get on my face. Huh? I'm going to get on my face. None of us are left without understanding, for he has given to us his word. It is a light unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. It's a lamp unto our feet. My wife is just like the Holy Ghost. She's always reminding me of the scripture. <laughs> Psalms 119.105. See, that's kind of how the, how the relationship goes down with the Holy Ghost, too, you know. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome, though? And every step we make outside the Word of God is a step of destruction. It's a step of risk. It's a step of peril. It may be the wrong step. It may be the wrong decision. It may take you down a road that you can't ever get off of. Because deception plays for keeps. And you gamble your soul, the risk of your soul. I mean, my wife and I here, my wife and I are here today to represent Jesus and his church. Because this is a mystery, Paul said. The relationship between a man and a woman. I, we do not want to bear false witness. We won't stand for it. People have been invalidated, are not allowed to be in ministry because their wives are, are, are rebellious. They're full of dissent. The church has not been, in many respects, what God ordained us and created us to be because we're in rebellion, we're in dissent. We want to have it our way. We want to do it our way. When God gave it clearly to us, the instruction in the Word of God, in His, in His Bible, we say, no, it won't fit in the modern 21st century. It won't work now. Wait a minute. Stop. God's in the future. He's not in the past only. The things that God's doing, it'd take us, it'd take us transformation to catch up with. And if we just were able to live out a life, if it was trillion years we wouldn't be as advanced as he is trillion years we couldn't catch up to what he was women you listen to me men you listen to me men of God if you follow Jesus Christ don't you let your wife be disrespectful of you 
Don't you let her dishonor you. Women, you chose. You said, I will admire him. I will love him. I will adore him. I will honor him. I will respect him. It doesn't matter. Good, bad, pretty, ugly, sickness, health. Huh? Come on now. And then people want to breach that order, that divine order. God instituted that. Not a man. Don't blame it on him. God instituted that. For it speaks of Christ in his church. If there's anything I do not want to do is misrepresent Christ Jesus. I don't want to misrepresent God's kingdom. Many people have been disqualified. They're not allowed to step in the anointing. They're not allowed to step in the place that God ordained for them because their house is not in order. Scripture says if you do not know how to rule your own house, how shall you rule the church of God? It's being tweeted right now, all these verses of Scripture I'm quoting. That way we don't have to take time up for you to look them up. I can get more done. Amen. And women think they can continue to be a part of a demonic influence. Anything that doesn't look like what the Bible describes is under the realm of a demonic influence. It's just that way. Men have been taught of the devil. They stepped into death and they stepped into darkness and they've been taught of the devil and to the point that Jesus said, you are of your father the devil and the, his works you do. And who was he talking to? He was talking to covenant people that were allowed to step into a relationship with God that had been given a provision. In the Old Testament, he was talking to the rulers even of those religious people. And folks, there's something that you and I have got to hear today right now. We can say all we want to say, say we know the scripture and go to church. They went to church every day, special holidays. They paid of their tithe and of their wealth, not not 10%, but more like 40% of all that they had and fasted twice a week. And Jesus said, you are your father, the devil. You've been taught of him. If what you do and what you hold on to and what you practice does not look like what God described in his word and the life that Jesus lived, there's change that God demands. And the good news is that he's brought the grace to bring the change. But it will not violate the will. It will not violate your will. We cannot violate the will of any man. Huh? Huh? And at what point in time the church says, I'm not going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to have his identity. I'm not going to listen to him. Huh? Listen to me. What have you done? Many people do that because it's it's already in their life. It's in their house. It's in their house. Say, why can't I move on with God? Because you're not willing to get your love life right. You're not willing to get the principle, the foundation right. Somebody said, well, if you, my husband's a rascal. <laughs> he is. Has is he, is he been born as a spirit? Is he following Jesus? Then what you did was you just brought a high treason offense against the kingdom of God and spoke against Christ Jesus, your Lord, because you can't do anything against God's divine order without touching God himself. It's true. It's true. People, you and I have got to come to a place where we begin to appreciate on a higher, at a higher level what God has done for us in his goodness and his grace. Suddenly, there appeared with the angel a heavenly host. And they were singing, glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. For this day is born in the city of David. The Savior, Christ the Lord. The one who would go and lay down his life for us. So that we would be able to fully follow him. So that we would be able to be in his household. Have his goodness. Walk in his ways. Learn how to say to everything that we've been taught in this realm of darkness. No, I want nothing to do with you. Feminism. Humanism. Modernism, liberalism, conservatism, and all the other isms. Conservatism has nothing to teach me. 
The law could teach me something. But I have a better realm to be taught now. And I'm not to be taught there. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm now taught of God. I don't need the law to convince me of sin. I have the Holy Ghost. The world doesn't need the law to convince them of sin. We have the Holy Ghost. He's present. He's here. Men sit in their perception and they throw down the advice of God. The influence of God. We're caught away with our own interest and throw down and cast down those things that God gently speaks. He just gently speaks to them. He says, do them and live. Huh? He, 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 he petitions us. He beseeches us. And when we become children, if we don't listen, he'll chasten us. Somebody said, God, God isn't going to force your will. No, he's not going to change your will. But you're going to, look, I'm going to tell you right now, he's going to severely try to grab a hold of it and jerk it in line. Huh? Somebody said, oh, you can't tell me what to do. Well, you're going to have to crawl over top of me to go to hell. Because I'm going to be doing everything I can do to tell you what to do. To be right with God. And I'm not going to give it to you out of my own ideas. I'm going I'm I'm to give you the word of God. I'm going to speak by the spirit of the living God. See, you know what I believe? You know what I believe? I believe that when you speak, it's not you that speaks, but the Holy Ghost. Because Jesus said that. He said, if I go before magistrates, if I brought into question concerning the faith, before authorities and religious leaders, how much more before people? It's not me that speaks, the Holy Ghost speaking. Huh? I've consecrated my life to live under his control. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he's going to touch every part of my life. He's going to touch the details about the things that I eat. Oh, yeah, he will. He's going to say, there's way too much salt on that because it's destroying your body. He touches it. If you listen, huh? he's going to talk to you about the things that you eat. Listen, it's going to cause, cause a disease. You're going to get a gallbladder disease. These greasy pork chops or whatever. <laughs> he touches every detail of our life. Don't stay up like get to bed. Because you can't, I'm going to tell you right now, when you get really tired and sleepy, you can't, you aren't able to yield the, and, and respond to the anointing to the Holy Ghost saying. That's why God's interested in your body, physical situation. Unless you flow and function in the anointing and you're ministering, then the Lord refreshes their body because you're running wide open to the kingdom. But you, I mean, you sit and watching TV late tonight, staying out at the movies, huh? Going to the skating rink, what? Climbing a mountain, whatever. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> the Lord's looking at us all the time. He loves us so much. He's saying, when will you stop living for your own interest? A whole world is lost and dying. When will you start living, stop living for your own interest? And when, 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 is, when does the love start taking a hold of you? When does the love and the compassion start taking a hold of you? Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. I'm going to follow him. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And he wasn't a politician. He just told people exactly like it was. Why? Because we're dealing with eternal business here. We're not deal dealing with some little choices. We're not going to model. We're not going to model. We're not going to stand for models that lead men away from God. We're going to model and stand for models that lead men to God. We're not going to participate with things that are out of divine order. We're going to consecrate ourselves and repent and get into divine order. And everything in our lives that we see that's not right, we're going to change. And we're not going to be hard about it. We're going to be easy and soft. Don't need a belt. Don't need a bit. Some people need a belt and a bit. Because they're stubborn. They don't understand. Stubbornness is the same as the sin of witchcraft. They talk about Harry Potter. I hear all these different women, and, I mean these women groups talking about Harry Potter. They witches themselves. They're stubborn witches. They are. They're rebellious women leading campaigns in churches. Rebellious who call themselves intercessors. Not interce you interce yeah, you're intercessor, but for the wrong person. Somebody said, Somebody told me, you can't have big church preaching like that. Yeah, I can. Watch. I'm in a big church. <laughs> very big one. I'm a part of a very big church. It's a church which is in heaven. Huh? I'm telling you, I got the remedy, I got the cure, if people will obey, to why the divorce rate is so high. Listen, the divorce rate is so high is because women have been taught to be rebellious. They're rebellious and they won't change. 
They've been taught to be rebellious. They've got to have it their own way. He, man, woman, world, rule. Listen to me. Do it my way. Forget about it. The church doesn't have the blessings of God and the glory of God that's supposed to be seen because we want to have it our way. We want to do it our way. We want to argue. I've never seen Jesus argue with the Father. Huh? Listen to this. Listen to this. If I start arguing with Jesus, right? If Jesus and I get in an argument, right? Who's arguing? Jesus or me? I'm doing the arguing because he's already said this is where we're going and he can't argue with himself. You're listening to me. You're listening to me. You're listening to me. Oh, they're arguing. I'm, he's arguing with Jesus. I'm not going to argue with Jesus. He said, just go do this. Here's how we're going to do it. And I'm going to say, yes, sir. So I'm going to pour out my Holy Ghost upon you and you all go and speak with other tongues and I'm saying, I'm hungry. Yes, Lord, whatever you want for me. I want you to love those who, do, I want you to love your enemies and I want you to bless them that persecute you. I'm not going to argue. Wives, submit to your own husbands. argument well I'll do it when he does it okay Jesus I'm going to obey you when you first prove to me that you really love me when you first give me the word of knowledge once I get the word of knowledge and I feel your manifest presence and I feel the comfort of the Holy Ghost then I'm gonna obey you women listen to me don't do that men don't allow it church don't do that leaders don't allow it can you hear me? I'm lifting up my voice. I'm crying out. You and I are supposed to be enjoying. God's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Jesus died at Calvary's cross so that you and I could step into the riches and inheritance that could possibly be imagined. He gave us his name so that everything that he has belongs to us. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Hallelujah. My wife, when my wife and I got married, she had a lot of more stuff than I did. She had a bank account with money in it. I didn't have a bank account, and I didn't have any money. She had an automobile. She had all these things. And she just gave them to me. What a blessing. What, what, that was blessed. I, get, I come in this relationship with Jesus. He's got everything. I got nothing. Now it's all the way. Now it's kind of reversed. Huh? I, get, I inherit all these things from him. But see, the Lord's blessed me now. He, I'm going to come back over here. The Lord blessed me so that now she has lots of stuff that the Lord's blessed me with. But none of it means anything to her. Huh? I mean, maybe this huge, gigantic diamond ring means something to her. Maybe the diamond ring means something special to her. You know. Because why? It just speaks of our covenant. It speaks, you know, it does. When I married her, I gave her a diamond ring that you'd have to have a microscope to see the diamond. <laughs> when I married Jesus, he gave me life. Give me an abundant life. Abundant life is, a, is Jesus trying to tell us a word that doesn't have a, you don't have a word for in the human language. He gave me all the riches of heaven, everything that he has. He gave it to me. He's free to give it to give us these things. Now you want to walk in them? You want to have them? You want to live, live in them? You've got to come into the terms of the covenant. He's really given us a much better life than we could have ever had for ourselves. He's given us a much better life than we could have ever designed for ourselves, ever. If we got trillion years to live. He's given us joy unspeakable and full of glory, peace that passes understanding. He's given us the ability to rule and reign with him, to walk around in the inheritance of all spiritual blessings, to be blessed in, our, in the area of our finances, to be blessed in the area of health, 
to be blessed spiritually, to have an increase in the anointing to where we can walk in divine health, where we can lay hands on people who are tormented and sick and diseased and see them set free and delivered. Praise God. It just goes on and on and on, the inheritance that God has given to us. Better than all the inheritance that the Israelites had with houses and lands and, 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 and flocks by the thousands. <laughs> He's given to us all the riches of His grace. Hallelujah. How do you and I start responding to Jesus properly as the church? Huh? What is it that we believe that he expects of us? And that he has a right to expect of us? Because there's, there's I'm telling you, every model is important to look at it. Huh? Listen to me. Men, if you're agreeing with a rebellious, defiant wife and woman in your house, then you are, the, you, you are a partaker of the same sin and under the same yoke of iniquity. So therefore, you're never going to understand what Christ res, w, w, would hold us responsible for. Because you deceived. You deceived. You'll never recognize your responsibility to God. It must be all his way. What? But he's stupid. Oh, he is. Well, okay, we're just going to pretend that you're not saying that about Jesus for a moment. Okay? But because he's following Jesus, Jesus is going to make him brilliant. <laughs> because you're going to come into divine order, he's going to take all the stupid away and make him brilliant. And, and, and he's mean. Okay, well, let's just say, pretend for a minute you're not talking about Jesus now, as you're saying your husband's mean, and you just give him Jesus. He's going to take all the mean away and make him gentle, just like Christ. But as long as you're demanding it and pushing it and pushing your agenda and living in the place of rebellion against Almighty God, and nothing's going to change. He's going to probably get worse. Listen to me now. See, what happens is all of a sudden, the Lord brings it down and he lays it out there. And many people look at it and go, I, d I don't want that kind of salvation. I just want the salvation where I don't have to go to hell. I don't want the salvation where I've got to obey it and do it all his way. Huh? Uh, I don't want the marriage where I've got to do everything my husband says. I just want the marriage so I can have the other benefits. Can we stop and look at the relationship between Jesus and the Father for a little while? Because the perfect relationship that God has demanded for to exist between Christ Jesus and the man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the name of Jesus. And we get to see it because of what he did for us at Calvary. We get to participate with the most wonderful kind of life that man could ever happen, ever have, it, ever have happened to them. Anybody want to be a vegetable? No, you don't want to be a vegetable. There's, veg there's, ve there's life of vegetables. There's vegetable life, right? Plant life. Sit around and photosynth all day. <laughs> if you have something come along and eat you, and if you don't get eaten, you just wither away. And if there is, if there is any, if there's any cell phones around, that's probably going to, or Wi-Fi around, that's probably going to shut down your life cycle too. <laughs> then there's animal life. Anybody want to be a dog? A duck? I could do insect life, invertebrate. Anybody want to be an invertebrate? Echinodermis purpurellus all day long. a sea urchin. Invertebrate life. I don't mean invertebrate life. Animal life. Duck. Your whole, you know, chicken, your whole, your whole venture of the day is to find a juicy worm or a bug of some sort. I mean, come on, think about this. Animal life. Human life. Human life is pretty nice, but it's just as bad as vegetable life in many respects. Probably vegetables have it better off. <laughs> I 
the Lord's given us a possibility of the spiritual life. And spiritual life is far better than human life. It's far better. It can't even be compared if we were to say, let's talk about plant life versus human life. And the differential between that. God's called us into the spiritual life, his life. The life where that darkness and that sin and that death and that sorrow and that everything that belongs to the laws of Satan no longer govern us. But we have a choice. Because self-interest says, I want it my way. What is your way? Well, I'm not really sure right now, but this is what I want. <laughs> but what you want is going to end in destruction. Ah, uh, that's your opinion. Well, just watch. If everybody had time enough, if everybody had time enough, if man had time enough, they would come to realize that God is, exists and that everything that he says is true. But you don't have that much time. I don't have that much time. I don't have that much time. Christ Jesus came on the scene, the incarnate word, came, revealed himself, made known his glory. Somebody said, just talk to me about the words. Don't talk to me about the responsibility. No, I'm going to talk to you about the responsibility. We're going to shine a floodlight upon your life and say, are you living right? Are you doing it right? And maybe you're not, but where's your heart? Do you want to do it right? Do you want to live it right? Look, that's what's most important. So we're going to have to show you where it's wrong. I was ministering to some, some people the other day, and they were trying to, <clears throat> young lady was saying, help me understand boundaries. All these guys pursuing me. And I'm telling her about just godly principle. And she's going, wow. Whoa. This is amazing. Really? This is the way it's supposed to be? Yeah. You know what was going on in her heart? I'm just hungry to know God. Because what I was doing was I was putting a big X. I said, look. She said, I mean, people want to know. Can you French kiss when you first meet somebody? Is it appropriate? When should we start dating? Because that's what society is th has declared. Look at it. Daniel was reading to me last night uh, off of the different news things coming on. It's an iPhone. Pornography targets 8 to 17 year old kids. And they have special marketing plans which they target them with key words on Google and other Yahoo. And other means that they use. The, the, our world is inundated with the powers of darkness. Paul described the atmosphere as being charged with the influence of the satanic realm. God sent Christ Jesus to die for us at Calvary's cross so that we could walk through the door and step over into a realm in his kingdom and live in a heavenly place ruled and governed by the Holy Ghost where we're taught the ways of God by the word of God and by the spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, women, you, do you know that you, have, you hold the key to whether or not your, your house is happy and full of peace? Not the man, you. You, women, you. You. Just like the church holds the key as to whether or not God's house is full of praise and thanksgiving. We, we, we do. He's there to supply you all the grace and resources and respond. Huh? And with that response comes an unlimited glory of heaven to fill us. But we, are we going to praise him? Are we going to rejoice in him? Are we going to give thanks? What is our relationship going to look like? He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. He's given us a, such a wonderful inheritance. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly place. What are we going to do with it? Amen. 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 Prepare to meet your God. Wives, you will be held accountable for the way that you treated your husband. Husbands, you will be held accountable 
for the way that you walked with Jesus. And you also be held accountable for the way you treat your wife when your wife is walking in divine authority. When she's, when she's being the woman that submitted to you and obeying you and reverencing you, yeah, you're going to be held accountable. If you, if you come back at that wrongly. But good, good news is God will chasten you. Huh? He chastens his son. He'll correct you. And if there's any possibility to possibility get you right, he'll get you right. Church, same goes for the church. The church will give an account for how we represented Jesus Christ in this earth. How we right here represent Jesus in this area. And the Lord resourced us with an amazing amount of rooms, square footage, and acres to get the job done. I'm just talking to the saints here today. I mean, I don't see a bunch of people that are lost. If I saw a bunch of people that were lost, I would have just been, I would have stayed with Luke 2, 13 through 14. Huh? I would have stayed with the message of prepare to meet thy God. But I just know, I know, I know one thing. The Lord wants to prepare us unto good, every good work. Things are going to have to get into order. Huh? Huh? They have to get in, come into order. They have to come into order. Divine order. God's order. That's, that's Father having His will, His way. That's where we're going to get His results. People think they can buck up against the leadership of ministry and be right with God. It can't be. They think that they can, they can touch leadership. They can take, touch a pastor, apostle, evangelist, a prophet, a teacher, and not touch Jesus. Let me give you some good. Let me give you a good word of advice. Don't mess with the man of God. Just don't mess with him. Don't matter what he believes. Don't matter what he's doing. Just don't mess with him. Leave him to God. Don't mess with him. Don't touch him. Because you're gonna get messed with. Because Father, his holy things may not be special to you, but they're very special to him. He's he's very jealous over his holy things. And it's not to say that each one of his people aren't holy. They are. And he's, it's not to say that each one of his people aren't special. They are. And what you do to the least of these, my brother, you do to me. They are. But he's got something. He's got their different areas of specialties. There's different areas of authority. Different areas, as it were, of sacred. Huh? And accountability. The Lord wants just to bless his people. He wants, his, he wants everything that belongs to him to flow to us freely. Then we have to have a proper connection with each other and with the authorities in our lives. We're going to have to come back to understanding that God's given us love and the ability to love in every dimension of life. Neighbors, that's everybody you meet. Say, my neighbor, my neighbor is everyone I meet. Say, prove that, to me. prove that to me. Not a problem. That's what you should always ask. Jesus, given this same message, said, talked about a Samaritan man. He talked about a man, rather, it was a, more than likely a Jewish man by context, who fell among thieves and he was left wounded and naked, stripped of everything that he had. And a priest walked by, and when he saw him, got on the other side of the road. Levi came, did the same thing. Samaritan came. Saw him, took him, bound up his wounds, took care of him. Right? You know the story that Jesus is describing who your neighbor is. The, the person you, whoever you come in contact with, you're accountable. That's your neighbor. Love them like you love yourself. Huh? You're not going to leave yourself there wounded huh? and naked. You're going to take good care of yourself. Hallelujah. Praise God. You're going to have to get into the love. Come on now. Come on. Come on now. I'm building up to something here. How you, in, how you interact with everybody in the church and what that looks like. You can't strain or try to gag yourself over a gnat and swallow a camel. In the, in the scripture, you're not allowed in the Levitical law to eat any manner of blood. So if a gnat flies down your throat, you've got to gag yourself. Ah. 
till the gnat gets thrown up, right? So Jesus said, you guys are gagging yourself trying to get the gnat out. Meanwhile, you swallow a whole camel. You eat the camel whole. Why? You're going to talk about these little details and these little issues and these little peripheral matters while all the time love is forsaken. Truth is forsaken. Bless them that persecute you. Anybody got to practice lately? Anybody been practicing? You raise your hand because you get to practice every day. Maybe you just unconscious. You know, there's several different realms of consciousness. Did you know that? There's unconscious incompetence. There's conscious incompetence. Huh? Are you with me? I live in conscious incompetence. I could do nothing of myself. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? Are you with me? Everybody wave at me. Uh -uh. If you don't have an opportunity to love your enemies and bless them that persecute you, you're living in a bubble. Because there's a lot of people who don't like you. It might make you feel good to walk around and act like everybody likes you, but I'm telling you right now, it's just simply not the truth. You and I have an opportunity to love them. When's the last time you went over and knocked on the neighbor's door, or knocked on the door of the person that hates you? Hey, just thought I'd drop by. Just had some, you know, it's a perfect time. It's Christmas. I just want to give you something. Bless you. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. You don't have to say, I know you hate me. Just say me. <laughs> Because if you start doing that, what are you going to start doing for those of the household of faith? When does it kick in and become a real responsibility that you're about ready to stand before the Lord and give an account for your soul? When does it become practical? When does it become real? Huh? When does it become real? When you start participating. Amen. Amen. And you can't export something you don't have at home. A lot of people can't love, can't love in the church like they're supposed to love because they don't have that kind of love going on at home. Basically what goes on at home is sibling rivalry. We pray, praying God for maturity. Are you listening to me? <laughs> and the children meanwhile are thinking, I can't wait till I get out of this house. Because dad and mom argue more than we do. And the same thing happens to them in the church relationships and people relationship around them. They start finding ways to disqualify people, not like people. It's a demonic realm. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So that you and I could step into the love of God and begin to love Christ Jesus and obey him. Because there is no such thing as love outside of obedience within that framework of relationship. There is none. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. He didn't say, if you love me, you will listen to most of what I have to say. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <coughs> so you're changing. You're changing right now while I'm talking to you. You're repenting right now while I'm talking to you. I'm going to have an altar call right now. Have everybody who's lived a rebellious life come stand up here. And repent. You're repenting right now. You say, I'm different. I'm a changing. I'm different. I'm a change. I'm changing right now. Changing right now. Because God's given me the power to change. It's called grace. It's the authority of change. I'm changing right now. I'm not going to behave that way anymore. But what's going to happen is you're going to have to wake up in the morning and deal with your cantankerous self. Huh? You're going to have to deal with irritability. Yeah, you're going to have to deal with stubbornness. You're going to have to deal with, you know, defiance. You're going to have to deal with argument, being argumentative. I deal with it. And I pray that your husband will point out, hey, you're being argumentative again. Ah, you're being irritable again. You need to be happy. Oh, don't tell me. Ah, it's picking on me. No, no, somebody needs to tell you. Because it needs to happen there so it can happen in the church. Because one day it's going to happen before the throne room of Christ, before the throne of, of, of Christ Jesus, in the throne room of God. 
You listen to me now. God did not hold the woman responsible for having things right in her house. He, be, he held the man responsible. God does not hold the church members for, responsible for having things right in the church. He holds the leadership responsible. Man says, well, if I tried to tell my wife that, my goodness gracious, we would, it, uh, we'd have World War III and everything would be over. It would be a nuclear explosion. There would be nothing left. Give it a shot. Get on your knees, start fasting and praying. Go ahead, let's just go for change. Um, but let me just say this. I'm going to say this. I'm, I'm closing now. I just want to say this because, once again, it's one of the biggest things that's going on in life today. In, in, in Christian families, Christian homes, and church today. That's why it's so important to talk about. If, listen to me, if your husband is not walking with the Lord Jesus, he's not submitted to the Lord Jesus, you don't have to follow him. Because it doesn't, it's completely out of context. He's being led by Satan. I mean, don't follow Satan. Don't follow the realms of darkness. Don't follow disobedience. But if, you're, if your husband is walking with the Lord, has a confession of faith, and is pursuing the things of the kingdom in his heart, he wants to walk with God, he wants to be right with God, you are absolutely responsible to follow him. Follow him. If the leadership of this church is following Jesus, We represent Christ Jesus, and you absolutely have the responsibility to follow us. You know what people will say in, in, in a modern context that are listening to the voices of Satan in this modern day? Oh, that's cultic. That is ridiculous. To even come up with such a crazy, to believe such a crazy lie. That we should come under the rule of our leadership and follow our leadership. Because your leadership was given to perfect you and you're not going to be perfect without submitting to your leadership. It's true. Your leadership has come to build you up and you're not going to be built up without submitting to your leadership. And it's by your leadership that the supply of everything that heaven has provided through Christ Jesus flows to you. Amen. Amen. So everybody's repented. That's here right now. You've repented, right? You've repented for your rebellion. You've repented for your stubbornness, right? You've consecrated yourself from this day forward. I'm just going to obey. I'm going to walk in humility. I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to walk in meek meekness. I'm going to treat my neighbors right. I'm going to love them as myself. I'm not going to start screaming and hollering when somebody's blowing their horn behind me going down I-5. I'm not going to enter it. Whatever it is that you do, I don't know what all these you do. Jesus does. Father does. And it's holding you back from the better things God has for you, and it's time to move on. Huh? Because he's got grace, plenty, forgiveness, plenty. All you got to do is ask for it and give it to you. Repent because you want to walk in a different way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You got a problem with somebody walking around with you saying, hey, you're not doing it right. That's wrong. You got a problem with that? Most people have a problem with that. Insecurity says, what are you doing? Always picking on me. Always some problem. Um, right? But that's exactly what the Holy Ghost is supposed to be doing with us. Walking around, telling us where we're not doing it right, showing us how to do it right. So you say you don't want it in one area, you don't want it in the other area either. Because I'm telling you right now, it's all or nothing. Whatever it is in one area, it's going to be that way in another area. Uh, I don't want that kind of rulership. Why not? Because pride, pride, arrogancy. I believe I got a good handle on it. Oh, well, then you've been anointed, anointed cherub. <laughs> With special ability to have no need. Come on, give me a break. 
Because if you had such wisdom and insight and understanding, you should be bringing tens of thousands of souls continually into the kingdom. You should have built a ministry that is absolutely going to stand until Jesus comes with such insight and wisdom. Are you listening to me? Sometimes the biggest, listen to me, I'm, I'm talking to you out there in YouTube land. I'm talking to you because some of the people in this room don't want to listen to another thing i got to say. Listen to me. With the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the power of God, we can go change the world. Sometimes the biggest hollers and complainers and dissenters haven't even brought one soul into the kingdom. They're doing nothing. Somebody said, so-and-so was saying this, that, and the other thing about you. I just said, go ask them what they've done in the kingdom. What are they doing in the kingdom? Besides running everybody down that's doing something in the kingdom. That sounds like Satan to me, man. It sounds like the, that sounds like the last devil I cast out. <laughs> Trying to stop the flow of the Holy Ghost and a, an advancement of seeing those things that Christ Jesus died for us to have so that we could set the captive free, cast out devils, proclaim liberty to those that are in prison. Come on now. Huh? In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. <laughs> you need to start doing something. In the kingdom. Get busy in the kingdom and you won't be so irritable. She said, I write these things unto you that your joy may be full. I'm giving you this word. I'm giving you this ability. I'm telling you, giving you this instruction so you can have fullness of joy. If you got fullness of joy, it's proof that you're in obeying God, doing what God said to do. Amen. That's what he said. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I've, I see a great harvest of souls coming in the kingdom. And I see Father laboring to prepare a place within his church to where that they come in they see a bunch of joyful people they see right. some people that, that that look like that they saints in the light they look like they've been redeemed they look like they have joy unspeakable full glory they look like that they interacting with god that god actually lives in them because we go out and propagate this idea that you'll be born again and god will come on the inside of you and walk in you and dwell in you and live in you and then they come and this is this god this is what it looks like when god lives in you this is, what it, this is what it's like when God lives on the inside of you. And you've got rivers pouring out of you of his presence. This is what it's like. <laughs> but they come in, they find a bunch of people given over to the living God who really know him, who, who have allowed him to live, who have allowed him to rise up, who do know how to flow and participate in the things of the Spirit. And that realm of divine glory is in their life and praise fills the place and joy and love and compassion and concern. And you don't, when, when we say, I'll go find some people to hug, you don't go hug the person that you feel most comfortable with. You're going out and following Jesus seeking to save that which is lost. You're going to the hurting and the dying, the suffering, the people in need. And then living in all this self-consciousness, you captivated by the anointing. This is my third close. <laughs> I sent out uh, a list of all of the meetings we're going to have this week. School of Evangelism. School of Missions. School of Film and Media. Various different things we're doing in youth ministry, developing children's ministry. Developing, and we're going to be developing special focus teams to really just look at all the things that we really need to be doing and then we're we've got a circle we're drawing a one mile radius circle there are literally thousands of people to reach in one one mile radius and we're going everything will be fully focused on giving everybody an opportunity to come and know jesus to come and get healed to come and get it receive something in a giveaway over and again to where that when that we're going to saturate it we're, we're, we, we see things within the School of Evangelism where we, right now where we're basically we have already street ministry, street evangelism going on. And, and Adam's taking the leadership on that. Pastor Kelly's got the leadership of the School of Evangelism. Adam's doing street, uh, leading up the street evangelism. We're going to get real effective and focused on that. And then we have crusade evangelism. And uh, 
You know, I've asked uh, Angela and Paulina to head up School of Missions for now. And we're going we're gonna to go after that. It's going to be radical. Back to the School of Evangelism real quickly. We've also got another dimension, which is Mercy Evangelism, which is for the uh, retirement homes, hospitals, and juvenile hall. There's so much to do, so many things to serve. The harvest is great. Get out of your little microcosm of your, of your world and look and behold that the fields are wide in the harvest. There's a huge, gigantic world out here of more, almost 7 billion people and most of them haven't heard nothing about Jesus. And if you'll step out of your own little realm and our own little world, you'll see that God's got great opportunity for you and there's a great anointing and a great life for you to live. And you'll be happy all day long. And rejoice forevermore. <laughs> when you come bring in the sheaves with you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we've, we've listed that. It's listed on my Facebook. It's listed on church Facebook. It should be listed on our website. Please be involved with us. Let me say this. The Lord wants to bless you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All you have to do is cooperate. All you have to do is receive and participate. There are laws of the Spirit that are going to result in you getting blessed. You don't want to obey the laws of the Spirit, you're not going to get blessed. Period. That's the way it works. There's not a thing in Christ Jesus that doesn't come as a result of obedience, beginning with your salvation. You had to obey and call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And it works that way all the way through. It's about obedience. And the Lord wants to bless us in such a way that we can bless all the nations of the earth. True. Just like he did with Abraham. He blessed Abraham so that Abraham could bless all the nations of the earth. And he blessed him in the realms of the material. And he blessed him in the realms of his family. He blessed him in the realms of the spiritual. There's a blessing for you. God blessed Abraham and we see such a mighty man of God manifested in soul prosperity, health prosperity, in financial prosperity. It was there. And then, his, and, then, and then ultimately, from his lowing spring, Christ Jesus. What a blessing to bless all the nations of the earth. Now the Lord says you bless, he did, he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. It's, it's ours to have. It's ours to have. It's ours to have. You need to stand, be faithful. Don't weary in well-doing. Because you shall reap if you do not faint. Just, just as we've done with this property. Just stand, petitioning, obeying. Walking straight, doing what God says. Don't forsake or turn away from the heavenly vision. Pursue those things which God has given you. Watch what, watch what will happen. Watch what will take place. Don't get off. Don't get off following your own ideas and following the ideas of men. Follow Jesus. Watch what takes place. Stand with me. The last thing you want to do is say, oh, I'm nothing. I can't. I'm no, you know, whatever, you know, having some kind of discouragement, complaining about your state. Don't do that. Worship Him and praise Him. When you feel like complaining, praise. Give thanks. Hallelujah. Because it's all a lie. Because God's blessed you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. The only reason you'd have a right to complain or think you have a right to complain is because it's not coming to you as fast as you'd like. Huh? Are you listening to me? God's faithful is promise. He cannot lie. Yes. God cannot lie. When Jesus says, verily, verily, listen to me. When Jesus says, verily, verily, literally it's a man, a man. It is to swear an oath. A man, a man. You could actually translate it with absolute certainty. Every time you see Jesus swear an oath, he goes, I swear an oath. Every time he says, verily, verily, or a man, a man, or absolute, with absolute certainty. I swear an oath. I swear an oath. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will do it. Hey, what? Yeah, it's true. I'm not the vision, Terry. It surely came to pass. And though it didn't happen quite quite as quickly as you wanted to, it's going to happen. Unless you weary. And faint. I pronounce on every soul in here. I pronounce on every soul in here. That you make heaven. 
I pronounce on every soul in this place that from this day forward, you're not going to listen to the influences of the spirit of disobedience or be influenced by the God of this world. I pronounce on every soul in this place that you're going to live in the spirit and walk in the spirit. For as many as are led by the Holy Ghost, these are the sons of God. That is going to take on a real and a practical dimension for your life. And you're going to watch yourself grow and develop and mature as you step into all spiritual blessings in Jesus' name. I tell you in the name of the living God, everything about your life is going to change so that you can have all those things that God has freely given. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Everybody just lift your hands towards heaven. The Lord's touching you right now. Healed. Healed. Cleansed. Changed. Filled. Filled, 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 filled. Filled, 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 filled. Filled up with the glory of heaven. Uh, <laughs> filled up with the presence of Jesus. Filled up, 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 filled up with the glory of heaven. Filled up with the presence of Jesus. Hallelujah. Say, Lord Jesus. I give my life to you to continually offer the sacrifice of praise, to walk in your love, to be clouded with humility, to be filled with your spirit, to do your work, Father. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> We want to encourage all of you next weekend, next, Saturday, next Sunday morning, spend the week focused on the things that you're doing to go bring the lost in. Yeah. Let's see a great harvest of souls come. Yeah. Bring them. I, we'll, just, we'll do those things that the Holy Ghost gives us to do, and we'll throw the net on the lost instead of trying to just spend the time on Sunday morning building up the saints so that they'll go ahead and go get the lost. Because we built, the saints are built up for the work, to do the work of the ministry. You perfected so the purpose of you go out there filled up with the compassion of the Holy Ghost to reach the lost. So let's do this. I want you to join with me in prayer and fasting. Join with me in faith, which is the most important thing, that we can reach the lost and see a great harvest of souls come in. Just pray with us and believe God with us this week as we begin to take another uh, a deeper uh, dive into the organization of everything that we're doing. And don't wait, don't wait on us to get you organized. Run, okay? But then we want you to also become organized, be very focused with us as we do these things in God because the Lord's purpose to give us great fruit. A great revival is taking place. A great moving of God's taking place in the midst of the church. Won't happen in every church. It's going to happen in every church who's hungry for it and wants to cooperate with God. Because what's going to take place is, Father, this is a day of His power. Father's going to bring in a great harvest. And um, I see it taking place tonight. The house will be full. And we're going to see people get healed. We're going to see people get touched by the power of God. And we want to see that happen on a scale of the thousands. That's what the Lord has purposed for us to do. And so let's just gather together in faith and prayer and consecration and commitment and watch God do this thing. Yes. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Lord has purposed for us to have continual miracles going on in our life. And one of the miracles that he wants going on in our life is the miracle provision of finances. And I know that you need miracle provision of finances because the Lord has purposed that you take care of the, of the orphans, the widows, the poor, the ch local church, and traveling ministry. So let's hook up together and see.
provision of plenty come. Because as you give, not sparingly, but generously, you'll reap a generous harvest. And God will make all grace abound unto you so that you'll have all sufficiency in all things. So what I want you to do is we want you to understand that the offering, that the giving... The bringing your tithes and your offerings. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity, an act of worship. Yeah. It is not just something that would belong to just a common event. It's not common. It's not ordinary. It's worship. Yeah. It re represents and belongs to that offering that Christ Jesus gave. Yeah. Because it's worship. Yeah. So why don't you just come worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings. And we want you to, and as you do... We want you to find people around you as they're returning from giving, as they're returning to, from worshiping, as they're returning from worshiping, as they're returning from worshiping. Then just hug them, love them. I mean, you can, you know, I want you to hug a bunch of people, tell them that you love them. Amen. And if anyone needs prayer for anything, Anybody needs prayer for anything? Sickness in your body? Not certain that you're right with God? Whatever it may be. Hurting on the inside, we want you to come. The Lord will touch you. We'll pray for you. The Lord will touch you. He'll heal you. Hallelujah.